there have been examples recently in the literature of multimodal models being able to do better in one modality because they have information from another modality. We see a really big opportunity in creating software and AI that can understand any type of media. We are multimodal creatures, right? You know, our, our sensory density and touch, first of all, is underappreciated and incredibly dense. Sight and sound, taste, smell, and seeing this explosion of creativity that's been enabled by these models has been extremely satisfying. One of the things that we face a lot in, in machine learning is choosing the right representation to express the world. Ajay, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. Delighted to have you here. Where are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from San Francisco, California. Nice. A popular choice for our AI entrepreneurs, for sure. And particularly unsurprising, given that you were suggested to me by an amazing recent guest, Joey Gonzalez, in episode 707. Wow. What an episode. That guy knows an unbelievable amount and acts so quickly, talks so quickly and in such detail. Yeah, really, A-plus episode. Uh, and we're grateful to him for suggesting you as a guest as well. Joey's incredible. He and I have worked on some projects together while I was at Berkeley. Yeah, and so we'll get into some of that Berkeley AI research shortly, but let's start off with what you're doing today at Genmo. So. You've co-founded a generative AI startup, Genmo.ai. And uh, in that company, you provide an approach to creative general intelligence, which isn't a term that I have used before, I don't think. So can you explain the vision behind Genmo and its role in advancing this creative general intelligence term? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to talk about that. So Genmo is a startup I've been working on uh, since December. We wrote the first line of code on Christmas and shipped it right after my PhD. Um, Genmo is a platform and research lab where we build the best visual generative models across different modalities, whether that's imagery, video, or 3D synthesis. And the goal of Genmo is to allow anybody to express themselves and create anything. Now, that's a huge, huge lofty vision. <laughs> How are we going to break it down? How are we going to get there? We see creativity and creative um, content production as a very detailed, actually really reasoning deep process, which involves many steps, many tools, many people working together. It also involves a ton of creativity and inspiration. And so we build tools and models that kind of get out of people's way and allow them to express themselves in uh, an intuitive interface. And so what I mean by that is that we try to make the software not the bottleneck in your content production. So let's say you wanna make a, a feature length film or you wanna make a, a movie. We wanna produce tools that will allow you to produce clips um, in a controllable fashion. We also make um, software for 3D synthesis. So if you wanna get down into the weeds and get a little bit more control in your pipeline, actually manipulate the underlying assets going into the, to the product, whether it's a game or a video, uh, you can get that out of the platform too. And so Genmo is kind of, it's an all-in-one place where you can create all this visual content. We also are primarily in a research and development phase and doing a lot of work at the cutting edge of visual generative media. Very cool. And so, yeah, so you gave an example there that you'd like to be able to create, say, film clips, um, probably in the media term. And I've got some questions for you about kind of big picture uh, and, you know, kind of feature length films later. But uh, just to kind of give our listeners a sense of what this creative general intelligence means, I guess, so the idea is that, yeah, as you expressed, people should be able to ask for anything and you just provide it. The, I know that a lot of your initial work is with visual things, particularly 3D renderings, but do you envision that eventually your, the creative general intelligence that you're working towards would be able to create other kinds of modalities as well? Like maybe maybe there would be natural language stuff or audio stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let me break down what we mean by creative general intelligence a little bit. Um, we see a really big opportunity in creating software and AI that can understand any type of media, whether it's visual imagery, video, audio, and text. The reason this AI needs to understand and consume that media is then it can understand the user's intent. It can understand the visual world that we as humans live in. 
uh, and kind of level up there. So I think a lot of the, the AI models that are available today, like ChatGPT, are a little bit um, deprived of sensory inputs. They're text-to-text models, right? They can they can observe this really signal dense, meaning rich textual format, and produce it as an output. The people we we are multimodal creatures, right? You know, our our sensory density and touch, first of all, is underappreciated and incredibly dense. Um, sight and sound, taste, smell. At Genmo, we focus a little bit more on the visual, the sight side for consumption because there's a lot we can contribute there. Long term, these models should be able to understand many different modalities. And I think one of the interesting things is that we know how to build AI that can be very general purpose. So with similar substrate, with similar architectures, similar learning algorithms, and similar pipelines, we can build software that can, once it's learned one modality, expand into another one and start to consume data from there and learn how to reason over it. That's on the input side. So part one part of creative general intelligence is building artificial intelligence that can take in any modality and understand it correctly. The next piece is to be able to uh, cooperate with the user in order to create visual content. And that's where the creative element comes in here. So we've already seen that language models have a lot of capability in, in creativity. They can write poems and stories and jokes. They can even understand them as well. Uh, a lot of the work we do is around really high fidelity visual creation. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, that fidelity is key to it. You know, and that's something that we, in the past year, there's been an enormous explosion in. Uh, it was in spring uh, of last year, uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, spring, I was giving a, a TED format talk and um, we'd had a few open AI guests at that time. And so I was able to get them to create some um, images using Dolly 2. So there wasn't public access yet, but you know I could provide them with a prompt. They would create an image and I would put it in my talk. And I had them pretty small on my slides. <laughs> and some of them looked pretty compelling when they were small like that. But now just a little over a year later, we have stunning high resolution photorealistic images thanks to the kinds of approaches that you've helped bring forward. So we'll get into that in a moment uh, as well when we're talking about your research, this high fidelity stuff. Uh, but yeah, let's kind of uh, focus on Genmo a little bit more right now. Um, what caused you, given the tremendous research experience that you have, the tremendously impactful papers that you've had, what was it on Christmas <laughs> that caused you to say, you know, now's the time for me to be jumping in, creating my own AI startup? Absolutely. So I've wanted to, to get products out to the public for a long time. You know, one of my original motivations for working on AI was to kind of enable new products that weren't possible before, um, where really the model enables a new kind of interface, a new capability. And the work we were doing in creative um, visual models felt extremely ripe for distribution. And actually, you know, so we got started because it felt like it was taking too long for technology to get out of the lab and into the industry. The second reason was in order to, to um, integrate across different modalities more effectively than we could do in an academic setting. And so in terms of that first bit about it takes too long to get technology out, um, while it seems like generative AI is this very recent half year, one year revolution taking the world by storm, a lot of these advances have been developing for many years, um, decades really. And what I was observing in academia was it would take sometimes three years to six months before advances we did in the lab started to get into the hands of creators where they could start actually using these models in their pipelines, right? Genmo, we want to tightly integrate the model development in the research lab with product and enabling people to access that very quickly on a matter of weeks. Um, so in terms of Christmas timeline specifically, <laughs> you know, I mean, what better time to, to, to get yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to hack and to, to build a product. So we launched with a video generation product that we had queued up, but there was a ton of engineering to do to actually scale up the systems. Yeah. And then, so what are the kinds of applications for this? So with Genmo, you're able to create, and people can, our listeners can go to genmo.ai right now and try it out, right? Yes, absolutely. They can go, you can go to genmo.ai, sign up for a free account and start creating images, videos, and 3D assets right away. Yeah. And so what kinds of people 
uh, would want to do this creatives, I guess. Uh, I mean, I guess it would be anybody that wants to be creating images. So in any kind of scenario that you could be using Midjourney, uh, you could equally be using Genmo, uh, but then Genmo is also going to be useful, you know, tapping into that general aspect of this creative intelligence. It isn't just text to, TD image, to 2D image, it's text to 3D image. Um, uh, so I guess it's probably relatively easy for people to imagine the kinds of applications like for us on the podcast, we sometimes want to have a, a YouTube thumbnail uh, for an episode topic. Like we recently had one at the time of recording on Llama 2. And so we used Midjourney to create this uh, Llama that's at a computer. Um, and, you know, so that kind of thing is fun. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you already talked about uh, video uh, creation as well, which is something that is just starting. So in the same way that I was describing 18 months ago, when Dolly 2 came out, it was a little bit cartoony. It was, in most cases, obvious that this was generated, um, particularly if you looked at it, um, you know, in a higher resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, 18 months later, everything's photorealistic. How, like, I guess, how much further are we away from that being the case with video, where it goes from being a little bit cartoony, a little bit obvious, uh, to being really slick, and then it's yeah so that's kind of what that's one question but then beyond that the kind of the 3d renderings that you're doing who is that useful for yeah absolutely it's been amazing how quickly you've been able to expand um the quality in the visual space and a lot of the methods haven't actually changed to be honest it's you know the stuff that data scientists are used Scaling. to doing data processing data cleaning really careful analysis of metrics and the iteration loop that you know every ml engineer is familiar with and um in terms of the integration of video and 3D, I actually see this as very naturally coupled. You know, we as humans um, take in raw visual sensory media, and then we, we're the ones who do the decomposition into different assets, right? Like a mesh is not a natural thing. A, a mesh a three, is a common graphics representation of a 3D asset. It's a representation we use in the computer to store an object. But then the day that representation is used in different media forms, whether you're using it for computer-generated imagery in a movie like Dune, whether you're using it in a game, um, whether you're using it for industrial design, like in SolidWorks. So we all have these different representations of the physical world that humans have created in order to be able to manipulate them and to be able to efficiently render them into compelling visual media. A video is, in some sense, the rawest form of visual experience, right? You know, it's, it's easy to capture. We constantly consume it. And it's kind of like a rendering of the real world, if you will. And so there are many approaches that we could take to directly generate video. And we work on a lot of those at Genmo. And that will advance very quickly over the next few months. Um, but there's also along that pathway to high fidelity video generation, there's opportunities to give people a bunch of value by synthesizing out these interpretable assets that they can inject into their pipelines. Tired of hearing about citizen data scientists fed up with enterprise salespeople peddling overpriced, mouse-driven data science tools? Have you ever wanted an application that lets you explore your data with code without having to switch environments from notebooks to IDEs? Want to use the cloud without having to become a DevOps engineer? Now you can have it all with Zerve, the world's first data science development environment that was designed for coders to do visual interactive data analysis and produce production stable code. Start building in Zerve for free at Zerve.ai. That's Z-E-R-V-E dot A-I. Nice, that makes a lot of sense. So basically the kind of idea here is um, probably most people have seen this kind of thing where, yeah, you have these like meshes. Um, so you can imagine like some shape like a vase. Um, and that vase has this particular, a vase is actually kind of simple because often it's going to be, you can imagine maybe like a pitcher is kind of like a better example because the pitcher has like a handle maybe just on one side. And so you could you could use Genmo to uh, you know say create me a vase uh, with one handle or with two handles, and then uh, it can create this this mesh. Uh, and I kind of imagine it like it's like I don't know why it's like black and green, like green like <laughs> lines around like this black object. And so it kind of it gives you this sense, even though you're looking at it in two D, if it's like rotating, it becomes very clear that this is. Um, a 3D shape and you can see, okay, when it spins around that one handle, 
you know, comes out and pops out mm-hmm, at me and then it, mm-hmm. it, it like goes back around to left and then, oh, here it is on the left. Here it is on the, on the right. It's just like, it spins around. Um, so you can create these 3D assets like the Boz and then a production company can use that uh, in their pipeline for video production where you have this, like the Dune example you gave, um, you know, in tons of films today, especially action films have these 3D renderings. Um, and so, yeah, so it can, it can be there, uh, characters can walk around it and it will have this sense of being quite real because it's been 3D generated. It's not this video asset, it's this 3D object that is downstream converted into a video asset. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's one of the things that we face a lot in, in machine learning is choosing the right representation to express the world. And so when you choose these representations, a lot of it is due to what's easy to process and what's easy to store and learn over. Um, I tried to take a tack during my PhD and also at Genmo to, to not just build the representations that are convenient for the modeler, but also the representations that people actually want. And so yeah, oftentimes yeah. for many people, they want these assets that they can import into their existing software and manipulate, even if, yeah. you know, even if we're still early in generative AI. Yeah, yeah. And then what you were saying is that these kinds of these 3D structures, then they make it easier to create photorealistic video, Mm -hmm. video realistic video, Um, (laughs) (laughs) where because you could have a collection of these objects and then they're combined together to create a a, a particular kind of scene. Um, And they can, I can see why that's, uh, yeah, uh, that's like a really nice pipeline. Uh, but it sounds like you are also working on kind of skipping that intermediate step. And eventually, I guess maybe through kind of, I guess the model will kind of have these latent representations of those just inherently where you don't need to specifically dictate, you know, that you want this vase of this particular look to be in this particular part of the scene uh, and do that separately. You can just, you can ask in natural language for a scene with a vase in the corner or whatever next to the couch and all of those objects, they are, they, yeah, they don't need to be rendered as this discrete 3D step because somehow the latent representation of the model just handles that seamlessly. Yeah, so absolutely. We're going to be moving towards a future in which the, as the model grows, as the model improves in its capabilities, it's able to learn these representations of the world itself. And so we can already see this with some of the video models that Jen was working on. We have some things coming out, should be out by the time this podcast airs. Um, where these video synthesis models will learn objects which are geometrically consistent. What I mean by that is it's synthesizing pixels directly, you know, pixels straight out, a stack of frames. But the objects observed in those pixels appears like it's the same 3D consistent object across the course of that video. So imagine it's a person rotating. As they rotate, you would expect certain physical properties to be preserved, such as conservation of mass, right? The amount of stuff in the frame should be about the same. If you had taken the approach today of an interpretable pipeline, which synthesizes the 3D assets, you import that 3D character asset made on Genmo into Blender, rig them, animate them, you get that conservation of mass for free, right? They obey those physical properties that we expect because they've been built into the pipeline. And this is extremely useful because it allows you as a creator to directly take the reins. The AI is just there to help you in steps of the process. As we build models, there'll be people who don't know how to take that asset, that mesh, and take it into Blender. They don't know how to rig it and animate it, but they still want to express themselves. For them, we're building these end-to-end trained video models, text in or images in, video frames out. Um, Today, you sacrifice a bit of control by doing that. But it's a lot easier to use and over time will become the highest fidelity option. Very cool. Yeah, that's exactly what I was imagining. Thank you for articulating it so much better than I could. Um, And a kind of a tangential question that came to me as I was thinking about this um, is there have been examples recently in literature of multimodal models being able to do better in one modality because they have information from another modality. So like an example of this would be um, a model that is trained on natural language data as well as visual data might be able to describe a visual scene better than one that isn't that doesn't have any of that uh, visual data training. And so, yeah, maybe talk a little bit about that and how that kind of feeds into this this idea of creative general intelligence. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is the trend we see across machine learning as an industry, not even specific to visual, that let's, uh, let's let the model learn. And let's let the model learn its internal structure from data. Um, and let's train on as much data as possible that is diverse. Um, in particular, for visual modalities, there's a lot of synergy across different formats. So training a video model is extremely expensive. By exploiting image data, we've been able to improve the efficiency of training and sampling those models quite a lot, uh, making it easy for us to offer it for free to the public to get started. Um, integrating text data is extremely useful. So it kind of, it's one mode of control, which is a big reason to use text. Your users like to communicate in natural language. Um, another reason is it actually helps the model learn the structure of the visual world because it's being described in the training data and categorized in all, all these different categories um, for you in, in that textual input. So, you know, I see a future in building towards creative general intelligence at Genmo, where we are building a research lab that is working across all these different modalities. Um, a lot of people ask us, why don't you focus on one? Why don't you just focus on 3D synthesis? Why don't you just focus on video generation? And I tell them, you know, we are. We are building it in the way we think will be the most scalable long term, uh, which is building models which can actually understand and synthesize the full 4D world. 4D meaning 3D and time with natural language controls in addition to visual controls for when people want to get really down into the weeds. Very cool. Yeah, that makes perfect sense um, and is very exciting. Um, so going back to a question that we uh, touched on earlier where, where we kind of touched on this idea, um, it seems like we're now not far off thanks to technologies like you're developing a Genmo to having consistency for video clips. I don't know, like, you know, maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into, is it like a few seconds? Can, can we stretch? I don't know, like what, what kind of time horizon can we get to now where we have consistent video? And how realistic do you think it is that maybe in our lifetimes, we'll be able to have feature length films with dialogue, sound effects, music, all of that created at the click of a button with a natural language description. So it's happening today. You know, so a few months ago when we got started, we had what I would call um, a flicker gram, something that it's more of a flickery style of video, trippy and psychedelic. And people love this for a lot of effects, perfect for water, gas, uh, cloth rippling or hair flying. What we exposed as a product was um, that you would upload a picture, you'd select a region of the picture, and you'd paint it in as a video, right? So you select a region of your personal photo or your AI-generated photo, and then animate that particular region of the photo. And then people could do things like add butterflies or make the water ripple, uh, make the, uh, w the waterfall flow. Um, I think there's actually a whole subreddit called um, Cinemagraph that does things like this. These mostly still photos where parts of it are animating. And, and this got extremely popular, right? And so this is one very low-level effect subtle animation. We had some knobs where you could dial it up, dial up the chaos, but you'd lose coherence. Um, a couple of months after that, we released a model for coherent text-to-video generation. Um, where you put in a caption, you get a coherent clip out, but it would only be two seconds long, low frame rate, think about eight frames per second. And so this is you know, interesting, but it wasn't yet at the quality that's actually really truly useful for people. So they in fact preferred our first animation style which could do subtle effects, but it could do it really, really well. We're continuing to improve that technology. That's is really just a quality problem where people want coherent motion, but they also want high fidelity. And that means high resolution, high frame rate. The next model that um, is coming soon from Genmo does 24 frames per second or more, really buttery smooth video, high resolution, um, full higher than 1280p video synthesis. It's still short clips, so about four or five seconds but we're moving that bar up over time. And really the bar is extremely high. You know, reality is a high bar to meet. Uh, <laughs> in this industry, one of the things that I love, love about working on generative models is that uh, the world just sets a really high standard for how high, how good we can get. Yeah, very cool. And then, so what do you think about this like idea of in our lifetimes having feature length films so that you can, you could say, um, 
you know, you could just type in, I want a podcast episode. Yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. John Crone and Ajay Jane. It's got to be uh, 75 minutes long and they're going to talk about creative general intelligence. Render it, please. With a human in the loop, we can get there, you know, arguably today, probably in a couple months, much better. Because yeah. um, I was watching I, I was watching this TV show, Dark. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a slightly dystopian time travel oriented TV show. And just really beautiful cinematography. And I was kind of carefully observing some of the cinematographic effects. And I realized that almost all of the clips in each of these TV episodes is only a few seconds, you know, max 10, maybe max, max 30 mm -hmm. seconds in a single cut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all these little clips are stitched together. And that actually, you know, that has benefits. It allows the director to have some control over the story, it allows you to zoom in on aspects that are of focus to what's happening in the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. 30 seconds is quite conceivable that Genmo is going to yeah. get there. And yeah. There's another problem that's probably on your mind, which is, okay, yes, each of these clips is 10 to 30 seconds, but uh, they're all of the same scene, right? Like, you know, the content needs to be consistent across that film. That is a little bit of a problem for these visual right. generative models today. It's also part of the reason why we go for this integrated general um, type of architecture, because we can imagine having a model, our same model that produces a video clip, not just conditioned on the text that you've typed in, I want, you know, a, a TV show about time travel, but it also conditions on the previous clips. Mm -hmm. And so at test time, just in, in the forward past, this model can preserve the identities of the subjects. They know that it's John. They know that it's me, a J in the past clip. So I should produce the same identity. They know the style should be consistent and so on. Um, I would say we're not there yet. It would take a lot of manual work and handholding by the user to produce at that TV show. I think that in terms of using these tools to produce clips that a human put together with their creative vision, that can happen by the end of the year, I think. Now that's an ambitious timeline, but I think it's going to get to the point where we can start to have, you know, YouTube level quality. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and full text in to the full movie, um, <laughs> it's a little tough to say. I think that's actually, yeah. it's actually something that I leave more to the users to build those kinds of pipelines yeah, after we expose yeah, yeah. the individual tools. This episode is brought to you by GraphBase. GraphBase is the easiest way to unify, extend, and cache all your data sources via a single GraphQL API deployed to the edge closest to your web and mobile users. GraphBase also makes it effortless to turn OpenAPI or MongoDB sources into GraphQL APIs. Not only that, but the GraphBase command line interface lets you build locally, and when deployed, each Git branch automatically creates a preview deployment API for easy testing and collaboration. That sure sounds great to me. Check GraphBase out yourself by signing up for a free account at graphbase.com. That's G-R-A-F-B-A-S-E dot com. Yeah, that's obviously a much bigger stretch. There's that consistency over very long time windows and creating a good story and all the subparts. But I don't, I don't know. It's like, if you'd asked me that a year ago, I'd say maybe it's not possible in our lifetime. Today, you ask me that, I'm like, that's going to happen. Like, I don't know how long it's going to take, but 10 years seems like a long time in AI terms now. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, very, very cool. Um, so a lot of your work today is inspired by research that you've done in the past. You're a prolific for how young your career is and how young you are, things like your H index. Um, so like this marker of how many citations you have across how many papers you have is very high. <laughs> and so uh, perhaps um, the most uh, well-known of all of your papers so far is on denoising diffusion probabilistic models. DDPM. Uh, that came out in 2020. And this paper laid the foundation for modern diffusion models, including Dolly 2 and the first text to 3D models, like the kinds of things that you've been talking about so far at Genmo. So can you explain DDPM, these denoising diffusion probabilistic models, um, and how they relate to other kinds of approaches like um, uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs, um, which were 
kind of, which were the way that people were generating images and videos uh, primarily until recently. And perhaps, I, I realize I'm asking lots of questions here, <laughs> but <laughs> perhaps most importantly is tying all of this into um, stable diffusion, which people like are probably, many of our listeners are probably aware of in mid-journey. That's the approach that they use and yeah, how it relates to, to your own work. Yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about the DDPM project. Um, let me give a little bit of context uh, to lay the, lay the landscape. So this was a paper that I worked on in 2019 and 2020, early in my PhD at Berkeley. I did my PhD with Peter Beale, who I believe has been on this podcast before. He is indeed, yeah. And I was very excited about the promise of generative models, but it felt like we had an incomplete picture, an incomplete set of tools, where it would take a lot of hand-holding, a lot of really careful tuning, um, data set curation, to even get something to barely work in visual generative media. Let me give an anecdote. So there was a project I was working on um, for in-painting. And the idea here was taking models like GPT that generate one word at a time, instead training them to generate one pixel at a time in an image. If you did that kind of thing, these models would only work at low resolution. And secondly, they wouldn't be able to do edits. They wouldn't be able to do something like replace, you know, some object in an image. Let's say you have that vase with a handle on a table and you want to remove it, clean up the background. So these, even if we could train these visual models to generate one pixel at a time, they would work at, let's say, 32 by 32 pixels, little tiny, tiny images. But we wouldn't be able to use them for manipulations. So I did a project in that space where we tried to scale it up and we tried to make them more flexible at editing. We succeeded to some extent to both of those. But there was seemed to be a hard limit where, you know, a to get to the interesting levels of resolution, like 256 by 256 pixel images, still pretty low resolution, but you can make out what's in the image. The model would take many minutes to sample an image because it's going one pixel at a time. You can kind of imagine as you scale up the resolution, uh, you're quadratically expanding the amount of time it takes to generate that image. Uh, so compute became a problem. The second problem with using GPT style models to generate images is that they would kind of become unstable and stop generating coherent co content somewhere along the line. So if you have like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pixels, the errors would accumulate where you would up one pixel, the model would sample something wrong. It's supposed to sample a blue pixel, but all of a sudden it samples a white pixel. Um, that error would start to propagate and the model would soon start, start, start losing the capability to understand what was going on and produce more of like a blurry mess. In addressing that computational challenge of tens of thousands of pixels, we asked the very obvious question of, can't we just generate multiple pixels simultaneously? Uh, <laughs> GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, were able to do that. Um, we started to work on Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC samplers, that could, in parallel, synthesize all of these pixels. Um, that project started to evolve over time into the Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Models paper. All right, nice. So yeah, so you're tackling this problem. You're realizing that maybe by uh, predicting multiple pixels at once, you're going to get better results in single pixels at a time. You realize that Markov chain Monte Carlo, MCMC sampling could be effective for that. Um, yeah. So how does that, how does that thing go on? How does that lead to this kind of stable diffusion approach? Yeah. Um, so once you start to sample multiple pixels at a time, the landscape is actually wide open for the architectures you can use. GPT-style models, these ones that generate one token, one pixel at a time, have some constraints in them. They are only allowed to look at the past because if the model could look at the future, the rest of the pixel, the rest of the sentence, it would be able to cheat trivially, just repeat its input. And so you have to constrain the architecture. Um, with DDPM, we realized that we could train a model which can see all the pixels simultaneously. But now there's another problem that... Um, how do we how do we actually synthesize an image? So with our aggressive model, it's clear you generate one pixel at a time, you look at the past ones, you generate the next one. In DDPM, we have a slightly different architecture where you start with pure noise. So the image is all noise. And the question we ask is, if we learn a denoising autoencoder, an, an, an autoencoder that can look at this noisy image and strip out a little bit of noise, people use this for video processing and like fine grain noise removal, is that denoising autoencoder actually capable of generating an image, not just removing a little bit of noise? Turns out the answer is yes. 
mm -hmm. found this, um, my collaborator, Jonathan Ho, found this project from Joshua Sol Dickstein from 2015 called the Diffusion Probabilistic Models paper that builds a Markov chain that maps from Gaussian noise, then iteratively denoises it in order to produce a clean sample. Um, there were a lot of architectural limitations in that Diffusion Probabilistic Models paper from Joshua, that early work in 2015. It didn't produce that high quality samples. Um, so in the DDPM project, we ended up making a lot of improvements to that framework, greatly simplifying it, changing the way we parameterize the model, coming up with new neural network architecture that worked a lot better. That neural network architecture is actually in, extremely similar to the architecture that Stable Diffusion uses. Um, one of the key things we did was reweighting the loss function. And so not to get into too much technical detail, but essentially when you do this denoising process, it turns out that there's um, most of the things that people care about are high level structure. What is the object? That there's an object kind of in the middle of the image. So I'm looking at you right now, John, on the screen. There's a person in the middle of the image. There's a guitar in the background. These are high level semantic concepts. Those are most salient to people. And so part of what we did was reweight our loss so that it would focus the model on learning these high-level things, denoising really high noise levels. So images that have extremely large amounts of noise in them, learning how to remove them. You might ask, removing noise from an image, how does that allow you to synthesize an image? The answer is, at sufficiently high noise levels, you actually need to fill in the missing content in order to remove noise. So let's say you have an image that is so noisy you can barely make out what it is. You can kind of make out that there's a circle in the middle of the image. Um, if you're able to actually strip out that noise, you're forced to learn what that circle might actually be, that it might be a face. Um, so this nice. formed the foundational foundation for DDPM, where this insight that learning how to remove noise from an image could allow us to synthesize an image. A lot of that project was improving the architecture to make it actually happen, allow that model to learn this. Because in order to learn to denoise, you need to learn everything about what an image can look like. And that's hard to pack into a neural network. Um, one of the interesting things that happened with that project is that it turned out to be a very stable loss function in the end. All you do very is you cool. take an image during training, you add noise, and you learn how to remove that noise. Nice. Yeah. So this makes a huge amount of sense. Um, this idea of iteratively removing noise um, while using a cost function that prioritizes the kind of salient objects in the image. Um, and does this kind of stability, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, this is genuinely, this is something that I, I know nothing about. I'm mostly working in the natural language world. So like my machine vision stuff is relatively weak. Um, does this kind of stability um, help reduce hallucinations or is, is that something that is a big issue in machine vision? Yeah, so I think hallucinations are definitely a problem in visual synthesis. They take a slightly different form. Uh, so text in natural language is really dense on meaning. Um, so there's stylistic things that it's coherent English. It, it abides by the grammar, right? So that's kind of what you might think about these low-level details visually. Uh, you know, objects aren't uh, at the very ends of the color spectrum, super saturated. They may uh, change smoothly. Images change smoothly. There are great sharp gradients around object boundaries. Those gradients are smooth like a curve or a line. Um, these are low level things uh, akin to the grammar of language. Right. These higher level semantic concepts are what we start to notice when we talk about hallucinations. You know, the model is saying things that are coherent English. It's perfect text, but it's incorrect and it's just made up, right? Well, with a visual generative model, we have exactly the same problem. And oftentimes it's actually a boon. A hallucination is a good thing because it allows people to create stuff that has never existed and never could exist in the real world. So fantastical combinations of two characters. You've seen people do mashups of animals and vehicles. So like a furry car or, uh, you know, um, a bat swimming or some things like that. Um, people with their hair on fire to create incredible artistic effects. And so these are hallucinations in some sense that they don't exist but they are what people want a lot of the time. So we need to build general purpose models that are able to generalize to these different semantic concepts. Um, another form of what might be called hallucination is that the model is getting some of these semantic ideas wrong, getting some of that grammar wrong. 
So let's say it generates, one thing we saw when we scaled up to high resolution faces is that the model would generate an eye with one color like blue and another eye with a different color like green. And so this can happen in reality, um, but in the vast majority of the training data, people have the same color eyes. And so the model is actually underfitting that distribution and hallucinating something that shouldn't be correct. Very cool. I like that uh, analogy between the grammar of natural language and the details of visual imagery. That makes a lot of sense to me at it, like an intuitive level. Awesome. Yeah. All the stable distribution stuff, obviously making a huge impact um, in your own work, uh, as well as in, you know, these kinds of popular tools like Midjourney. And it's wild to see how this is going to continue to get refined with the kinds of things uh, that you're doing, these 3D representations, longer video, really exciting the area that you're working in it must be really satisfying for you to kind of have a new architecture and then you're like 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 you, you probably hit your head on the wall your team uh for weeks or months at a time sometimes trying to get like something to work and then you finally crack it and you're like wow you get these stunning like this whole new level of visual capability yeah you're really working in an, in an exciting nexus of ai yeah, it's been it's been fascinating, and seeing this explosion of creativity that's been enabled by these models has been extremely satisfying. I'm very yeah, happy about sure. it. Um, I think let me give one anecdote about yeah. about this. So once we had identified some of these architectural building blocks that were really scalable, uh, things were actually very easy to extend and and to build uh, in new settings. So here's an anecdote for that DDPM project. We built a, a model that could synthesize faces on the celeb A celebrity face data set. It generalized to more in the wild faces out of the box. These are things that GANs could do though. GANs mm -hmm. like StyleGAN were able to synthesize high fidelity faces, even higher fidelity than we were doing. However, what they couldn't do is be able to, to be transferred out of the box to a new setting. They needed months of engineer time, tuning the hyperparameters, calibrating it. They were extremely unstable. What we did is we took that same model, same architecture, same loss, same hyperparameters, and just swap the data set from 30,000 face images to 1.5 million images of different settings, like cats was one of the data sets. Another data set was churches. And another one, really interesting, was like a million image data set of bedrooms, L-Sun bedrooms. And oh, these yeah, are photos yeah. of the interior of people's bedrooms. Deploying machine learning models into production doesn't need to require hours of engineering effort or complex homegrown solutions. In fact, Data scientists may now not need engineering help at all. With Modelbit, you deploy ML models into production with one line of code. Simply call modelbit.deploy in your notebook, and Modelbit will deploy your model with all its dependencies to production in as little as 10 seconds. Models can then be called as a REST endpoint in your product or from your warehouse as a SQL function. Very cool. Try it for free today at modelbit.com. That's M-O-D-E-L-B-I-T.com. I've seen that even from years ago with like relatively early GANs, like in the mm -hmm. first year or two of GANs, I remember that data set as being a really mind blowing moment for me because I could show like you could move through the latent space of the GAN that was creating these bedrooms and it would like s slowly shift the perspective on the bedroom or slowly change the color of the bedroom wall or yeah. And so that was actually one of the first, yeah, that data set was really important for me in realizing how crazy things were becoming in AI. That's that's awesome. Yes, these these latent space interpolations are so fascinating. Um, they reveal some of the interior structure of the model, and I think it's also very humanistic because an interpolation is the first step to a video in some sense. Uh, <laughs> like a video is a very particular kind of interpolation. Right. If you want to look at yeah, it, like that. it's like an interpolation over time. Yeah, interpolation over time, where each frame is similar to the last one, but they change in a particular structured way. And so those mm -hmm. bedroom interpolations that you probably looked at, they don't change in a in these physically preserving ways. The conservation of mass is definitely not there. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting things about the Elson data set is that it started to generate photos of art on the walls. And so oh. we generate these, these pictures of someone's bedroom, right? And people have art on their bedroom walls uh, that they purchase online and hang up. And so you could actually see in the model, the samples, there would be little pieces of artwork just hanging on the wall of someone's bedroom sampled from the image. And this bedroom doesn't exist, that art doesn't exist, but it would be there in the image nonetheless. Uh, and the second thing that's really interesting is that that just worked out of the box, right? Same hyperparameters, it worked well enough. I did a little extra tuning, 
I doubled the model parameter count after we submitted the paper. So then in our rebuttal, when the reviewers come back with the critical feedback, you can say, oh, actually, we are now better than the GANs. <laughs> we forgot to include that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that, that anecdote is super helpful um, for me able to understand how this kind of technology allows you to move more quickly than folks who are working on GANs, where, yeah, the hyperparameters on that are really tricky. Like, because uh, really quickly for our listeners, when you have a generative adversarial network, the adversaries, you have two different neural networks. And one of them is um, like this discriminator that's judging the quality of the work and trying to trying to figure out which ones you get. You basically have this data, you have your real image data set, and then your, you have this generative neural network that creates fake images. And that discriminator is tasked with trying to figure out which ones are the real images and which ones are the fake ones. And then you... Um, you backpropagate through both of them together where you only change the weights in the generator so that your generator starts to be able to figure out what kinds of images do I need to create to dupe the discriminator into thinking that they are real. And, um, and it's, it's getting the hyperparameters right on like the learning rates of like that discriminator network versus the generator network are really tricky. Um, yeah, I've certainly fought with those myself. I've done GAN stuff. I haven't done this more, um, yeah, these, these more stable approaches, um, that you're working on. Um, so in the same year that you published this denoising diffusion probabilistic models paper, this DDPM paper, um, you and your brother, uh, Paris Jane, you co-authored an article called contrast of code representation learning. And that's another big paper of yours. How does that paper relate to everything that we've been talking about so far? Yeah, so this was um, hearkening back to some of my research origins where I used to work on compilers. I, out of chance in undergrad, found a professor working on compilers and started working in that area and got very interested in performance engineering. I got to Berkeley and I was working on these language models and visual synthesis models. And I realized that code was a ripe area where, you know, if we could learn neural networks that could understand code, um, we would be able to use them all over in our developer pipeline, scratch our own itch, you know, fix bugs for us, detect issues, write types automatically, summarize complicated hairy code bases because researchers don't write the cleanest code. If I could get an AI to summarize some of that, it would be helpful. And so ContraCode was a step in this direction of um, a kind of a new way to learn representations, neural representations of software. It was a very small community at the time. This area has exploded in popularity with the advent of uh, Copilot Git and OpenAI Codex, models that can synthesize code. But it's a little bit of an old field with a lot of work. And so ContraCode, this project I worked on with Paris, uh, who is also my co-founder, by the way, we were working on a method that could represent code in a way that's more robust than past approaches. By robustness, what I mean is that, let's say you take a function, right? That needs to do something like um, sort an array. There are many different ways to implement that same function. That function can uh, be implemented with different algorithms. It can be implemented with different variable names. It can be implemented with comments or without comments. But for the purpose of neural network, these should have the same functionality, right? At the end of the day, they implement the same functionality. And so ContraCode was a method that would be structured to learn the same representation regardless of how you implemented the function as long as it had the same functionality. In doing that, we were able to demonstrate a lot more robustness against little changes that people would do, little changes that would completely change the behavior of your learning algorithm. Very cool. And so, yeah, so an early effort at these kinds of um, code uh, suggestion tools that, yeah, now are abundant and are, make it so much easier and so much more fun to write code, like it's been, it's been game changing for me. I can do things so much more quickly. Um, yeah, particularly with slightly older libraries that are <laughs> already like <laughs> embedded into the model weights of like GPT-4. Mm -hmm. Then it's just so easy to be like, I got an error, just please fix it. Uh, and you actually, you do get really helpful like learning, learning steps along the way. So you can really now just dive into like, you're like, oh cool, there's uh, this package that I wanna learn how to use. I've got this project that um, you know would allow me to learn that package, and you can just dive right into it. You can just 
you know, you have this instructor that is able to, to really help you out. Um, and, and, and in a really friendly way, I love how friendly, uh, GPT-4 is with me when I make mistakes. It's so like, Oh, I can see why you mm-hmm. did that. Uh, good effort. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you just make yeah, this time working change. with a human, it's, it, it's tough to work with people. Right. And yeah, so I he- think, uh, I think OpenAI has done a great job calibrating some of the expectations of the model against people's expectations. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's so friendly. Um, but yeah, related to this, um, how do you think like these kinds of uh, these kinds of code reading, or I guess even natural language reading uh, models? What are the implications for security analysis or the potential vulnerabilities in adversarial settings? There are, there are tons of vulnerabilities. I mean, you can you can dramatically affect the behavior of a uh, neural code or neural language model by changing the phrasing of your question or by introducing extra tokens and text into the context. Um, and it, it's not always clear that scaling the model addresses all these vulnerabilities. Some of them are pretty fundamental, that there always will be avenues to attack and affect the behavior of the model. If it wasn't possible to affect the behavior of the model, it wouldn't be able to understand what you write because fundamentally the rest of your code base or the rest of your text expresses some some meaning that the model needs to understand. So it has to be sensitive to that. Um, However, there are certain classes of changes that we can make our models more robust to. Things like this expressing um, different functionality, subtle perturbations to the data. We can make our models more robust to that little by little. Some of this is through data by training on more diverse data. Some of it is architectural in cases where you can make it a little bit more robust. Um, I think a lot of the work we did at ContraCode on um, loss function changes that would make the model more robust turned out to not really be required at scale, where at scale, by scaling up our data, a simpler loss function can learn similar things. Because by seeing a hundred different implementations of merge sort, the model will automatically learn similar representations, even with the GPT objective. If you have a smaller data set or you want to fine tune your model and specialize it to a new circumstance, like your enterprise's data, objectives like contra codes objective become pretty useful in that you can you can handle having a much smaller data set, yet still retain that robustness. Yeah, uh, you saying it like that. Are there people using this like commercially now, or uh, are there like open source implementations that are easy for people to use if they want to be doing that kind of fine tuning on their own enterprise data with ContraCode? Can they do that today? So we have an implementation of ContraCode. It's researchware, so we haven't touched that repository right. in a couple of years. <laughs> uh, that's on GitHub. Um, it's possible people are using some of these ideas, but I don't personally know. Um, one of the core things there is around a data augmentation approach for programming languages where we data, do data augmentation by recompiling the code into a different format automatically. So if mm-hmm. anything is being used out of it, I would imagine something similar for code language models could be used in the industry where you take your data set, which is even though it's a small fine da- fine tuning data set, there's off the shelf compiler tools, which will rewrite that code into a hundred or a thousand different ways. And you could train mm-hmm. your model on that augmented set. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, very cool. It's amazing how many different, uh, areas of generative modeling you've touched on, Mm -hmm. uh, in just in these relatively few number of years that you've been doing research. It's wild. Um, another area that is super fascinating to me, this is something that you were doing before Berkeley is at Google brain, you worked on generative neural radiance fields. So, uh, the, the short form for that is like nerf, like the Nerf guns, <laughs> uh, so N, uh, capital N, lowercase e, capital R, capital F, so neural radiance fields. And so these generative neural radiance fields, generative NERF, uh, these allow 3D scene representation, which obviously we've talked about a lot already in this episode. How did the NERF stuff lead to the kind of 3D object generation stuff that you're doing today? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Let me give a little bit of background on NERF. So NERF is a Berkeley homegrown uh, paper that came out around our TTPM paper as well. What a NERF is, is it's a representation of a 3D scene in a neural network's weights. So with normal neural network, you picture a model which can take in data and then output some predictions 
and generalize to new data. So during training time, it's train on certain input-output pairs and then can generalize at test time. Um, a NERF is actually extremely overfit. It's basically, it's like a JPEG where you take some neural network representation of a scene and you pack in visual content for a particular scene in the world into that network. So you can sort of imagine, let's say you have this 3D environment, a room, an indoor house. You can represent that with a bunch of photos. You can represent it with these meshes that I talked about. Those are the meshes are human created representation. A NERF would automatically learn a representation of that scene that stores the colors. The wall is white, the guitar is yellow, um, but it would also store some elements of geometry. At this coordinate X, Y, Z, there's a lot of matter. There's something here that's absorbing light. In this area, this other area, X, Y, Z, is free space. So that's really, it's a lookup function, mapping from X, Y, Z coordinates in space to color and to density, telling you the amount of matter in that space. That's what a NERF is. It's a, I think of a NERF kind of like that JPEG. It's just a representation of a 3D scene that allows you to interpolate really nicely to new camera poses. So unlike a JPEG that expresses a single perspective, with a right. NERF, if you train it, you can now run it at a different perspective and interpolate between the different input images. And so how does this connect to generative media? Yeah, like how, how does that create, how, like, so I mean, it, it's obvious the kind of connection there. So, so you're using a neural network to store information about a scene so that um, regardless of, you know, where in the scene or what angle in the scene you want to render, all the information that's needed is there in the NERF uh, representation. Um, and so it's actually, it's pretty obvious to me how that's useful for the kinds of applications that we were talking about much earlier in the episode, where if you want to be, you know, rendering uh, scenes for a film or you want to be rendering 2D images um, of some 3D space, this is going to be, uh, this is going to allow you to do that. I guess my question is, how does, how does that NERF work relate to the kind of work you've been doing more recently at Genmo, for example, or at Berkeley, um, I suspect that you're, that there's like some kind of connection, some kind of, um, yeah, some kind of continuity, um, and, and improvements over the years. Yeah. So I think all of this is connected to this vision of creative general intelligence. These are different instantiations of what I see as that general purpose creative model. Um, some of the, that model learns how images work. You know, by denoising images, it learns what's the content of visual worlds, but doesn't know anything about motion. It doesn't explicitly know anything about 3D geometry. We also train models on video. Those models know more about geometry because they see objects moving. They see cameras moving. It knows about how objects move, so it learns some interesting things. Um, then we develop a lot of algorithms that can take these general purpose visual priors that have learned how the world looks and how the world works in an abstract level and distill them down into something low level, like a NERF. I call NERF low level because again, it's just storing the contents of the scene. We need these really powerful generative models that learn how the world works. And then a powerful algorithm that we develop at Genmo to distill these visual priors into this interpretable 3D representation. Right. And so, so that's kind of like a post-processing step to take right, this, right, this, right. this foundation right. model we are developing and then extract out not an image, but extract out a 3D scene. Very cool. That's awesome. So yeah, so um, so they're related in the sense that we're still talking about yeah reconstruction of a real world scene, but the nerf stuff doesn't actually generate. It's not yes. like it's it's a it's a map for for regenerating something that has already been conceived. Mm -hmm. um, but the Genmo stuff that you're working on today. Yeah, Genmo could equally output pixels or this NERF representation, and that NERF representation would have much more flexibility in the sense that somebody could take that NERF representation and render it however they like. So you'd kind of have, it's actually, it's kind of interesting. It ties in maybe with that idea that you were talking about if we wanted to have um, a bunch of different shots in the same scene in a film or a TV show, and you want to have that consistency scene over scene, this kind of NERF representation could be perfect for that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's um, by synthesizing out the sample that's 3D consistent, you're 3D consistent by default when you go ahead and render a camera trajectory. And a camera trajectory rendered out is a video. 
Now there's still a gap here, I think, when we come to video and motion, where these nerves are static. They don't mm -hmm. actually express motion. Um, but this is some of the things we work on at Genmo. We build a foundation model, and then for different customers that want a particular format, we build these algorithms that can extract out that really high fidelity version. Very cool. Um, and so kind of going even further back into your career history, all the way back to five years ago, <laughs> which seems like, yeah, forever in AI time, um, you were um, working at Uber. Um, so I guess that was an internship. Yes. Um, but you were there for a while. Like, it was like a nine-month internship or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so you were working in their advanced technologies group, ATG. You were a machine learning researcher there working on self-driving cars. And specifically, you were forecasting pedestrian behaviors. So this is super cool. Um, so and it's obvious to me why this is so important. If you want to have a self-driving car, you need to be able to predict if there's somebody walking on the sidewalk and they're walking, you know, parallel to the sidewalk, like they're like in the same direction as the sidewalk. That's a very different kind of signal to somebody standing on the sidewalk and walking into the road. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and so, you know, I can, it's without having spent any time on this kind of self-driving problem myself, it seems intuitive to me that that kind of recognition, having an AI system that can recognize that and notice it in advance and say, okay, you know, that's 200 yards away, that pedestrian, but that pedestrian behavior of stepping into the road, that's a very different kind of signal to, you know, dozens of other pedestrians that are just walking along the sidewalk. Yeah, this is, this is like really um, a proving ground for developing these really capable foundation models that know how people behave and to synthesize video. At Uber ATG, we weren't interested in synthesizing pixels. But we were interested in forecasting behavior. And the reason you need to forecast behavior is to be able to plan. So you can, you, there's multiple steps in a self-driving pipeline. There's the sensory inputs. There's perception of how the world is at this instant. Where are all the objects? What is their spatial relationship? What is that object? Then there's the problem of forecasting how are those objects going to interact and behave, whether those objects are static, like a traffic light, a car, or whether they're people interacting with each other. Once you have this complete picture of the past, the present, and the future, now you can run planning algorithms and robotic stacks to try to predict a safe trajectory for the, your vehicle to navigate that world. But predicting the future is really critical, right? I think people do this inherently. When we walk down the street, you see someone coming towards you, you don't want to bump into them. You need to be able to predict how they're going to behave because if you assume that they're just going to stand still, there's no problem. Um, we built generative models, honestly not that different from GPT, GPT, that could predict how people will behave over a course of time. Whether they're going to stay on the sidewalk, whether they're going to turn to avoid you, whether they're going to cross the street. Um, and this was a really interesting problem space that got me hooked on this problem of forecasting the future and, and learning generative models of the world. Um, but it's, 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 it still remains to this day a very important research area and one of the core problems in self-driving. No doubt. Um, so when we think about this, when you're thinking about pedestrian behaviors, does that involve, yeah, I guess actually, no, I, I just kind of answered my own question because I was thinking, does that include if they're in a car? I mean, I guess like if they're stepping out of a car, that starts to then kind of become, it like bridges this world. But I guess there you'd otherwise, you'd probably have some kinds of models of vehicle behavior mm -hmm. where even though there's a human in the vehicle they're not a pedestrian because pedestrian by definition is somebody like walking <laughs> uh i think like the whatever the greek or latin root is right there in like the ped yeah. uh part of the word um but yeah there's this interesting yeah transition state between being in a car and having that vehicular behavior and then becoming a pedestrian which actually which might be particularly tricky to like bridge um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't really asked a question, but you might have something interesting yeah. to say anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's some great observations. It feels this arbitrary distinction, right, between uh, different categories of objects. Why are we having different interns working on different categories of objects? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Does it make sense? Well, yeah, I would argue it doesn't make sense. It makes sense because the challenges are different. It makes sense because a pedestrian moves much slower. So you need architectures that are much finer grain, look at a smaller region of the world. It makes mm -hmm. sense because 
pedestrians have social interactions. They're also more agile, um, but vehicles are have constraints on how they can move and they operate over longer distances. So there's some practical reasons why they're different. But conceptually, as a person, we share a lot of the same machinery for understanding whether uh, a lot of the same underlying neural machinery for understanding whether a biker is going to behave a certain way, whether a pedestrian is going right, to behave a certain exactly. way, a swimmer, a kayaker, or a car, like a lot of that machinery right. is shared substrate. And this is, yeah. gets back to creative general intelligence, that we should be learning models, foundation models that can understand all these categories of objects and people and behaviors in one unified way. Then if we need to extract a certain subset of that capability, like we just need a really good pedestrian predictor, that can be read off of the same underlying model. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is the direction the industry is moving towards, is more general purpose models. But the transition is slower because they have different const- practical constraints that need to be met. For sure, yeah. it's There's safety issues in that kind of world that are different from in your world. Like if a pixel gets uh, rendered incorrectly, maybe you, know, you just don't use that sample and you generate another sample. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But in driving, it's not like you can't generate another pedestrian. Um, (laughs) um, One chance. uh, Cool. So, yeah, so we've covered this really interesting arc from the Uber ATG stuff where you were forecasting pedestrian uh, behavior. And even though you're not rendering pixels as an output, the model needs to be able to represent the world in a similar kind of way to when you're rendering video like you are today. Uh from Uber, you had the Nerf stuff where you're, uh, you have these neural representations of 3D scenes. Uh, at Bear, you have the Contra Code project, the, uh, the stable, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't mean to say, the, the diffusion model stuff where you're more stably rendering um, visuals um, with that kind of algorithm relative to GANs. And yeah, all of that together brings us nicely towards the creative general intelligence stuff, the truly groundbreaking work that you're doing at Genmo today that is state of the art. Um, Over all of that time, over your entire research career, is there a paper that you're most excited about or most most proud of? Like, is there some kind of research contribution that really stands out to you? Uh, Maybe one that we haven't covered yet? It's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, there's the impact metrics, the denoising diffusion probabilistic models paper um, was an extremely impactful project. And I'm proud that the community has taken notice and grown around it. That took a lot of time because I think it made me realize when something is really new, uh, it's one thing to to move a benchmark. It's another thing to change the way people work. And it took right. quite a lot of time to change the types of methods people use in practice. Um, so that's obviously one of the most impactful things. Another thing I'm proud of is this work in 3D arc that we talked about. So we talked about NERF. Um, that was a sequence of two years of trying to make 3D synthesis better and better. And that culminated in this project of Google Brain Dream Fusion, where you can put in a caption and get out a high fidelity object with the fusion model. In terms of, pro- of one project that I like that I think is a little underappreciated, um, I had a hard time staying away from compilers. That's partly why Contra Code <laughs> happened. There was another compiler project in there yeah. <laughs> around a, a, it's called Checkmate. Came up with a flashy name, checkmate, breaking the memory wall with optimal tensor rematerialization. This is mm-hmm. another project with my co-founder and brother, Paris, uh, that he led. And the idea here is that as we're training all these neural networks, getting bigger and bigger, learning all these things about the world, it's getting really hard to train them from the system's perspective. And so that project tried to make it so that us researchers with just a couple of GPUs at the time, before the startup, and in, in academia could actually train big models. How do we do that? So we learned a system, we trained a system um, to uh, reduce the memory consumption of these neural networks a lot. So, you know, you could take a model which would take, let's say, uh, 80 gigabytes of GPU memory and train it with only 16 gigabytes of GPU memory. Now your lab can save tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on hardware. Uh, that work has had some impact. Now it's a very common technique for people to use. Recom- this this idea of reducing the memory consumption with some of these algorithmic techniques, um, but because it's a it's a systems paper, I don't talk about it too much. Focus more on the ML yeah, side. But, but this is something that immediately seems super interesting to me. So I mean, yeah. 
I'm at a small startup. We're trying to, you know, spend as little as possible, but train the biggest models that we can. Mm -hmm. So uh, an approach that we use regularly, especially for model serving, which can be way many, many more orders of magnitude, more expensive than your training because you, you only need to train the model once, but once it's in production, hopefully you have a lot of users and they're going to be calling that API a lot and you're going to end up spending tons of money on inference. So like 99% of your cost in training and running a model is going to be on the running part. Um, so you're specifically talking about the training problem here, uh, but, the, but even there, like there's, you know, I would love to be uh, not having to rent as many beefy GPU servers in Google Cloud um, and be able to, cha to train more cheaply. Because that also, it allows you to then iterate more quickly, iterate more like recklessly. Like if you're not like too worried about an experiment maybe being throwaway, you can do more experiments and some percentage of those are going to end up being really high reward um, risks that were taken. So yeah, so like, you mentioned that some people are implementing this kind of stuff. What can I be doing today to be training with a training models with a smaller memory consumption footprint and saving some money? Yeah, there's there's a lot of things. So um, some of this technology have trickled down into uh, deep learning frameworks. Your local deep learning framework has some functionality. What we had in that project was a way to optimally select certain layers to compute twice. When you're training, you typically run each layer once during a forward pass. You run each layer once during a backward pass to actually compute updates. Um, we said that you can recompute some of these layers, run them twice, so it increases the computational cost. But in doing so, you don't need to store the, the output of that layer. You can delete it. And it turns out that GPUs have gotten a lot faster, uh, but their memory footprint, the amount of memory they have, has increased more slowly. So that's a perfect trade-off to make. So even if you do have a high memory GPU, you might not be utilizing it fully. You might want to train with a bigger batch size. So it's still worth it to, to make this trade off and recompute some layers. You can double your batch size, triple your batch size, use half the GPUs that way. Um, if you want to get started there, PyTorch has a, a function called checkpoint, checkpointing, not storing the checkpoint of the model, but rather it's a function that you can wrap certain layers of your model with to recompute them during the forward pass. The downside, though, is you have to manually select which layers to recompute, and that takes a little bit of black magic. Our project, mm -hmm. again, was researchware that we never um, ended up fully integrating with deep learning frameworks would select those layers for you automatically in the optimal oh, way. Oh, wow. Wow, sounds like a big opportunity there. Maybe there's some listener out there who can take advantage of the open source researchware you've already made and uh -huh. incorporate that in. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Wow. Um, awesome. So yeah, those are some great practical tips. Like, yeah, increasing your batch size to make sure you're taking advantage of the hardware, the GPU hardware that you have. Um, yeah, and then this uh, PyTorch layer checkpointing sounds like a great idea. Um, more generally, getting into some general questions now, it is mind blowing to me the breadth and the impact of the achievements that you've had in your career already. What kinds of, yeah, what kinds of tips do you have for our listeners who would like to become tremendous AI researchers or AI entrepreneurs um, like you are? And you know, maybe something that would help us frame your guidance on that would be, how did you end up deciding to, to do this for a living, what you've been doing? How did this all come about? Well, I um, wanted to be a designer for a little bit back in college, uh, but well, like I failed a graphic designer. Internship. Like, Sorry, yeah, like a graphic designer. Yeah. I had, uh, I went to, there's this design studio called IDEO, um, big consultancy. They had events in Massachusetts where I was doing college. And I started to do some of their events. I started to take drawing classes and architecture classes, media design. I really loved it. Um, but then I tried to get a job as a designer internship at Figma, actually, <laughs> in case there's a Figma listener out there. <laughs> I could only get a job as a front end engineer. And I, I love that stuff, love doing it, but I thought, you know, this isn't going to get me to be able to express myself visually as much as I would like. So I ended up focusing more on research uh, to, to make it easier to make graphics. I think what I always found helpful 
getting started in research was to have kind of a, a toy problem, kind of a challenging problem in my mind at any given time, um, whether that would be something like, how do we make high fidelity imagery? Let's say that's the problem. I would go into the classes I was taking or go into the conversations I was talking with other researchers with that framing in mind. So I could recast different tools I heard about, and then figure out how I could apply it to that problem of choice. And 99% of the time, the things you hear about aren't useful for your problem. But in that 1% of the time that it is useful, it could be the make or break, right? So, and it also kept me you know, motivated through all this stuff that wasn't connected to my core problem to, to wade through all these classes in the PhD and so on by being motivated by a core problem, which was getting human level, high fidelity synthesis. Um, another tip um, would be to do, I think, to actually like implement the difference between something not working, completely failing, and then getting stunning results is sometimes a couple of implementation decisions and really well-tuned software. So if you're an engineer and you're a little bit intimidated by the AI, the stats and the math, um, do know that really good engineering skills are critical to making these kinds of systems work. And so it's worth investing in those and worth getting your hands dirty because AI software is just another type of software. Awesome tips. Yeah, uh, for sure. Being able to yeah, really get your hands dirty with the software is going to make you a much better AI researcher or data scientist for sure today, especially as data sets get bigger and bigger, our models get bigger and bigger, the kind of even the DevOps around being able to train these models gets more and more complex. The better your software skills are, the better off you are for sure. And that relates to things like the kind of hiring you're doing. I know that you're hiring engineers and research engineers. And when I asked uh, guests on the show, if they're doing any hiring, they're almost always hiring engineers. But open data scientist roles, like this kind of standalone data scientist, those are relatively rare. Um, so yeah, I couldn't agree more. I also, before I, I've got a question for you about the hiring that you're doing, but before I get there, I think that there's an interesting thing that I just want to point out here, which is kind of cool to, to call it explicitly, which is that you wanted to become a graphic designer. You couldn't get the job that you wanted. And so now you've created an AI system that does the job automatically. That is like a, <laughs> you're now able to, like you've now created AI systems that already exist today and people can be using for free, but in the coming months and the coming years are gonna get even more and more and more powerful that allow people to take a natural language input and do graphic design. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you've really showed them. <laughs> well. The way I like to think about it is that lets people, the reason I didn't get the job is because I probably was not qualified. <laughs> I was doing all the scouting, right? And um, I think what it, what, it, what it does is it lets people like me who want to create, who just don't have the skills, even after many classes, um, to be able to start to create, whether it's a hobby or whether it's for work. And that's what I think is the beautiful thing. You know, it's, it's technology and art are closer than most people think. And by leveling up the technology, we enable new forms of art. We also enable new forms of work. But yes, it was easier for me to write code to make visual content than for me to actually <laughs> <laughs> create it. You don't want to see some of those early proto drawings. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. All right. So yeah, so back to the hiring thing. Uh, yeah. What do you look for in the people that you hire? What makes a great, I mean, uh, what you're doing at Genmo to be like right at the cutting edge there where the things that you come up with at your startup are driving what's possible in the world in 3D rendering and video rendering. I'm sure there's tons of listeners that would love to be working in a company like that. What does it take? Yeah, definitely. Um, we are ramping up our hiring a lot right now. So there's a bunch of opportunities. Um, you need to be able to work in a fast-paced startup environment. You need to be excited by some of these vision. I think one of the core things we look for at Genmo is people who are able to um, see an ambitious future and um, make forward progress on it, break it down into steps. And so we, we set vision, but we trust our people a lot in order to um, solve really hairy problems. I think that's one of the things that research does, but engineers are very familiar with this, you know, seemingly insurmountable problem, figuring out how to break it down and, and break through those walls. 
Um, we are hiring for product engineers, front end engineer, full stack, infrastructure engineers. On the research and development side, we are also recruiting for um, our oceans team. Our oceans team is responsible for large scale data infrastructure, um, in particular, curating and, and improving the quality of data sets um, that we use in our models. We are hiring additionally for research scientists. Um, I know a lot of research scientists from my network, but if there are people looking for research scientist roles in this podcast, we are actively growing our research team as well. Awesome. All right, Ajay, this has been a tremendous conversation for me to be able to enjoy. I'm sure our listeners have as well. Before I let you go, do you have a book recommendation for us? Yeah. Um, I worked in Kevin Murphy's team back at Google, and I have to give a shout oh, out to his really? book, Probabilistic uh, Machine Learning. Yeah. Have a new edition out this year. Um, great guide, great textbook. They have one of the figures from our paper, <laughs> so I have to recommend it. Um, I also liked uh, The Code Breaker, the, the biopic on Jennifer Doudna and the CRISPR development. It points out a lot of the subtleties and technology development, um, the people behind the technology, the scientists, um, and as well as the impacts of the work they do. And it's a, it's a huge topic to keep in mind as we work on AI. Nice, great recommendations. Kevin Murphy's, an earlier edition, I haven't read this year's edition yet, um, but an earlier edition was certainly helpful for me in my machine learning journey, an excellent uh, machine learning textbook. Cool that you were able to work with him. It's it's. I, I mean, it happens in this industry. It is smaller than you think, but it's wild to think like those kinds of names like Kevin Murphy to me, it's just like a name, but to you, it's like this person. <laughs> <that> <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so yeah, so if people want to be able to follow your thoughts after this episode, where should they follow you? Yes, yeah, so if you want to reach out about the rules, um, you can email at hi at genmo.ai. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at jjane. I post stuff. Genmo AI is our handle on all social media platforms as well. Nice. All right. Thank you, Ajay. This has been such a great episode. Uh, I can't wait to see where the Genmo journey takes you next. Maybe in a few years, you can pop back on and fill us in on those full length movies that you're rendering. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We can generate the visuals for this episode. <laughs> nice. Sounds great. All right. Take care. Truly incredible what Ajay has accomplished in his young career already. There's a terrifically impactful future ahead for him, for sure. In today's episode, Ajay filled us in on how his generative models can create cinema graphs by allowing you to automatically animate a selected region of a still image, how his diffusion approach laid the foundation for well-known text-to-image models, Dolly 2, and the first text-to-3D models. He also talked about how 3D generations are useful for video editing pipelines today, but increasingly, models will be able to go effectively from natural language directly to video pixels. He talked about how in the coming years, we'll likely be able to render compelling 30 second video clips, making it even easier than it is today to stitch together a feature length film from generated video. And he filled us in on how generative neural radiance fields, NERF, enable neural networks to encode all of the aspects of a 3D scene so that perspectives of the scene can be rendered from any angle. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Ajay's social media profiles, as well as my own at superdatascience.com 711. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another horizon-expanding episode for us today. You can support this show by checking out our sponsors' links, by sharing, by reviewing, by subscribing, but most of all, just keep on tuning in. I'm so grateful to have you listening, and I hope I can continue to make episodes you love for years and years to come. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.